Treasury stick just changed around here, buddy. You're looking at it. You are now listening to the Outsiders Podcast, the most exciting and hard-hitting show on the net. And now, bringing it hard as always on the Kansas City Chiefs and the NFL, here are your hosts, Clint Schweitzer and Noah Groniger. And once again on the Outsiders Podcast, we are bringing the heat because we are the only podcast on the internet that goes back and reconnects with all your favorite former NFL players. We are bringing it today. We've got Sam Rogers coming on, former Buffalo Bill. Of course, he was a Colorado Buffalo. And uh, just cannot wait to get Sam on here talking about those early 90s Bills. Oh, 94 to 2000. He just missed out on losing yes. four straight Super Bowls. Probably lucky in that aspect. Uh, you always want to play in the Super Bowl, but losing four straight, I couldn't imagine the pain and devastation. Yes, we're going to go ahead and bring him on now. Sam Rogers, a cornerstone of that defense uh, with the Buffalo Bills. Uh, in the mid-90s and on into, of course, the Music City Miracle, which we will begrudgingly bring up to Sam. All right, and we keep it rolling here on the Outsiders Podcast with a very special guest right now, talking to football with the former Colorado Buffalo, former Buffalo Bill, Sam Rogers. That was actually harder to say out loud than I thought it would be when you're talking to Colorado Buffalo's Buffalo Bills. Sam, how are you doing, my man? I'm doing pretty good. How about you, Sam? Uh, doing great. Just talking to football here in June, and uh, and why not, right? Oh, yeah, the time of the season. Yeah, we got OTAs going on, and uh, baseball has hit a lull, so we're talking to football, and we are glad to have you. And, uh, of course, you know, Sam, you, you played, uh, you know, with the Buffalo Bills uh, coming off of their four Super Bowl appearance, appearances. I mean, let's go back to that before we get into maybe some college stuff. You were, of course, a Colorado Buffalo here in the Big 8. Uh, we're here in Missouri, so definitely old-school Big 8 territory, but in the Buffalo Bills, second-round pick. And uh, you go to a team that had just went to four straight Super Bowls. So, I mean, what what was going through your mind when you get uh, picked by uh, Marv Levy and the Buffalo Bills? Uh, the first thing that went to my mind was, wow, I get a chance to go to a Super Bowl. I'm on a Super Bowl contender team. Uh, it's close to home. Guys like Doug Kelly, Canelius Bennett, Bruce, Jim, Thurman, all them guys. I grew up watching them play. And it was more, one of the most exciting uh, moments of my life. Uh, going back to your college career at uh, Colorado, you played with some great NFL players. Uh, you were one of them yourself. Uh, Greg Beaker, Cordell Stewart, Chad Brown, Dion Figures, Ronnie Bradford, Ted Johnson, Michael Westbrook, Charles Johnson. I could keep going, but I'm going to stop there for now. What do you What did you think about playing with guys like that? Oh, man, it was, it was a pleasure playing with him, but I, but, but I got to say one name because he's my, my partner. Because I'm a partner in my war. You know, Definitely. But the Mount Warren was my partner, but uh, but playing with those guys, you know, getting to Colorado, you know, getting to Buffalo, so out of JC, out of JUCO, and getting to uh, uh, Boulder, you know, it was one of the most friendliest atmosphere, family atmospheres. You know, Coach Mack had, a, had you know had a system set up like that, and you know, matter of fact, Greg Beeper was my uh, my uh, summer camp roommate when I first got to it. So you know, it was, it was a nice experience, and, and, and those guys are great guys. Look, coming from Colorado and uh, going into that the '94 draft, what what were you being told as far as where you might go? And did you? I mean, was was there a possibility of you being kind of a fringe uh, first round pick? And uh, how did you feel about you know being selected in the second round, which is still a very good honor? And uh, you go to a, obviously, like we talked about, a, a, an awesome awesome team. Uh, going to going into that season, you know, first of all, going into the ninety three ninety four season, uh, my uh, whole mindset was to be the best. I mean, to be the top five linebacker in the Big Eight. You know, that year we had some great linebackers in the Big Eight that was up for a lot of the awards and all this other stuff with Trey Edwards, Jason Dealer, Keith Burns, Arby Beavers, Ronnie Warford. You know, with a great group of guys, and I said if I could put myself in the top five, I could give myself a chance and. When I pick my agent, and one thing, I, the reason why I like him, and that fact, Frank Bow, me and my, uh, him and myself, we had uh, still close friends because he was just honest with me. He said, hey, man, I don't know if you're going to be a first-round pick or a seventh-round pick. Okay. It's hard to tell because you had one great year, but you stood out so much that you go anywhere, but, you know, there's a lot of guys that like you. You know, so, and that's, and that's what it was that with that. So 
So I, just, I was just going to be happy just to get drafted. To go in the second round, it was like a dream come true. Of course, you played seven strong seasons with the Buffalo Bills, right in the heart, you know, following their great success, going to those four straight Super Bowls. You know, of course, uh, sad news coming this week, finding out that uh, quarterback Jim Kelly is uh, b- battling cancer of the uh, upper jaw. I mean, just talk about uh, what Jim was like as a leader and as a player, and then, you know, kind of, you know, what your feelings are you know, hearing this news that has just come out. Uh, but first of all, me and Jim, you know, always remain friends, you know, every time I see him while I'm in town, I definitely used to speak with Jim. Uh, he came out here one year, and it so happened I went to go see Isaac Bruce at a hotel. He was sitting at the bar, and he was the first thing he did, he grew, and he was like, Jim, you know, what's up? Yeah, you know, what's up? And then he said, hey, you know, I'm going to be here with you guys, and I'm going to be here with you guys, and I'm going to be here with you guys, and I'm I know our prayers are out, out for them, out with them as well. I told a lot of guys I'm going to get back up to, up to Buffalo this year. When I get there, I definitely going to go by there and see them. But, you know, with the faith and power of everything, you know, the Almighty, I think he got, you know, he's going to be okay. You know. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we're definitely, uh, you know, sending out prayers for, for Jim. And what a, what a great guy. Uh, great times there uh, in Buffalo. And, uh, you know, speaking of great guys, you know, of course, you played – uh, under a couple of coaches there uh, in Buffalo. You transitioned in the middle of your career there from uh, Marv Levy, who just, you know, all sorts of wonderful stories about him, great guy, and then into to Wade Phillips. I mean, what are some of your memories playing for uh, for Marv, and then uh, how was it in the middle of your career transitioning into, you know, uh, Wade Phillips? Uh, the playing for Marv was like uh, a guy who – it was a long shot, first of all, getting into the league. And to go to an organization with a uh, professional like Mars and play up under his tutelage is like uh, almost like all the stars and moons and everything lining up together. You know, you couldn't ask for a better coach a rookie year, you know, coming off of one big year, change of position, and for him to go in there and he'd be your coach. And then and the way he coached, the way he talked to you, Everything the way the guy was, even in, in, in New York, it starts with the top at, at uh, Mr. Wilson. And when mm-hmm. I was Mr. Wilson was the kid all the way down to the organization when I was there. And it was a blessing. And and then, then moving from Wade, I mean from Mark to Wade, it was almost like the same people. You know, yep. fun, fun guys to play with, laid back, you know, not no hollering at you type of coaches. They tell you what they expect out of you and expect you to do it because you're a professional, and that's what it is, you know. And so I, I, I think my whole career, you know, I was blessed to have to have two tours of the great coaches that I've played. I mean, that never coached the game. Can you talk about in 1998? Rob Johnson comes in, uh, gets a 25 million dollar contract. Uh, struggles with injuries. Doug Flutie takes over, takes you guys to 11 and five, and then uh, Wade Phillips makes a controversial decision to play Rob Johnson instead of Doug Flutie, who got you guys to 11 and five. You know that that right there is is something that I, I would never understand. You know, but I would never uh, question Wade's decision on why he done that, and the reason why, he, and the reason why he did do it. But it was awkward, and it was, you know, when you got that momentum going your way, I think you should keep the momentum. You know, but I think Wade was more seeing that Rob could handle the pressure, get in there and get ready for the following season because he did sign a 20 million dollar contract and he had to get on the field at some point and, uh, and, 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 and be the leader of that Buffalo Bills team. So I think, you know, whatever was going through Wade's mind, you know, we all as players, we had to accept it. And we had to do our job, regardless of what, what you know, what quarterback he uh, went with. But again, I I don't know why he did it, but I think it was at a point where we had a momentum going our direction. I think we should have stuck with the momentum. Well, Rob Johnson comes into that playoff game in 2000 against the Tennessee Titans, and it's uh, forever known as the Music City Miracle Game. Rob Johnson uh, almost had the game won, but not quite. Uh, what do you think of that Frank Wycheck to Kevin Dyson throw? Uh, was it uh, behind the line, over the line, and what are your thoughts on that entire game? Uh, well, Rob, you know, it was a you know, total team effort. We knew going in there was a long shot for us to beat them, beat them guys, but, but we knew the guy that we had, we had a great a great chance to go ahead and beat them. And as you know, we were one play away from moving to the next round of the playoffs. Uh, as far as the play, uh, it was a breakdown 
total breakdown on the special teams. You know, it was not Bruce the Evans' fault. It was not Wade's fault. You know, we've been taught and, and trained all year long on how to stay in your lanes and do what you're supposed to do. And take that. Take that. Besides that, the ball was over the line of scrimmage. You know, I looked at it, I looked at it a thousand times. And and actually, I was, on, I was on the field at the time. If you watch the film, I'm the one reaching that, that Frank while he's throwing the ball. And then I turn and run and try to catch Te- uh, Kevin and at the, and all in the same breath. Wow. But when I watched, I watched, I watched, it was that close enough where home field advantage will always win. Sure. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, forever etched in the minds of all NFL players and coaches and fans. Everybody remembers that, of course. That And oddly enough, of course, you played into the early 2000s, but the Buffalo Bills have not been to a playoff game since that day. Uh, I mean, talk about that because this is a, you know, in the 90s and from the late 80s, early 90s, the Buffalo Bills, that that was one of the great franchises in pro sports. And talk about now the fact that the fans are having to endure. Uh, I believe the Buffalo Bills are the last team to to make the playoffs. I mean, they, they haven't made the play. Every other team has made the playoffs since Bills have. I mean, how do you feel about the direction uh, of the Buffalo Bills uh, in 2013? First of all, I love the draft that they have this year. I really do. I think, I think uh, Buddy did an excellent job this year in, in the draft picks. I sat and watched the whole draft, and I said, wow, I really feel they got all their needs this year, me personally. And I think they got guys who I feel can, can come there and uh, contribute to, to the Bills trying to make it to the next level. You know, but we need the veterans to step up. We need the veterans to do what they have to do. You know, we we'll have a young quarterback in there. So I think, you know, the veterans want to step up and carry the team until this young guy get, you know, get, get going because you know, everybody knows it's hard for uh, a rookie to come in there and really control a football game. You know, as far as I'm not making the playoffs since, since, since the 2000 season, I feel there was a lot of, you know, and I'm going on the limb on this, I feel there was a lot of when Greg Williams came there. You know, Greg Williams came there, he wanted a clean shot instead of you taking guys who helped this team all these years get you somewhere, you ex everybody. You know, you, you, you can't come in there with a veteran team and treat them like they're kids and ex and ex and other veterans, you know what I'm saying? So when you treat Henry Jones and Phil Hans like they're kids and you get rid of myself or Ted Washington and, and a few other guys, you know, guys who are like the meat and potato of your team, you know, you you should expect that. You know, you should expect that. Then you come in there with this with this with this attitude. And and I think that's what happened. And and, and I think ever since Greg Williams, they never recovered from that. And that's the honest truth. Going back to your career with the Buffalo Bills, can you talk about playing with Jim Kelly, Bruce Smith, Thurman Thomas, Andre Reid, and what their mindset was going into your rookie year after they had just lost four Super Bowls in a row? Well, when I when my rookie year, I was still amazed with the, I'm in the locker room with these guys. First of all, and the second thing I tell people to this day. I never seen a group of guys who could turn it on on Sundays. I never seen that in my life until I got to the Buffalo Bills. Third, the third thing, I never seen a guy work as hard as Daryl as Kelly did. I thought Daryl Kelly was the most uh, overachieved, under uh, recognized guys on the Buffalo Bills team. I, I really do. You know, he, you know, you of course it's hard when you got a Bruce Smith, you know, you got a Canadian Bennett, a Jim Kelly. Thurman Thomas, Ken Hawes, may rest in peace. You know, you have all these guys that's overshadowing this guy who I thought was probably one of the uh, the heartbeats of the defense. Uh, back uh, at your Colorado days, you uh, played with an infamous person, uh, Ray Carruth. Uh, do you have any memories of him uh, back in the Colorado days? Uh, were you guys buds hanging out? Uh, and uh, what did you think about when you heard the news that uh, he had took his wife's uh, life? Uh, when I, uh, first of all, well, I, you know, Ray, it was shocking because Ray wasn't that type of guy. You know, around us, you know, everybody had their Jack and Hyde moments whenever they behind closed doors. But around us, you know, and, and you know, he hung around more, most of the older guys. You know, like myself and Lamont Warren, you know, he hung around us a lot more. And, and he was a guy who was a quiet guy, well-mannered guy. And when I heard the news, I was totally shocked. I was totally 
was shocked. I, I, and, I, and I honestly believe that, you know, he got there, got scared, got around the wrong dudes, and somebody persuaded him and said, told him this, or whatever the case may be. But him, from what I know of Ray Cruz, I was totally shocked on that, on that situation. Well, I'll tell you what, Sam, it's uh, wonderful that you were able to join us today. We really appreciate it. Definitely want to catch up again uh, as the football season gets a little closer and talk about some more current football topics. We are so grateful to go back over your uh, your great career in Buffalo and beyond. So thank you so much for joining us, and we'll definitely want to stay in touch, man. We really appreciate it. Okay, our next topic is your big players not getting jobs in the NFL. Let's make that a next topic. Hey, writing it down. We got it. We'll do it. <laughs> All right, y'all take it easy. I appreciate it. All right, no problem. Take care, Sam. All right, you too. Thanks a lot, Sam, for being on with us. Great stuff, going back to his career. And you know what? We uh, we went a few dark places, had to bring up that music, 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 City Miracle, which if that was my favorite team that that happened to, I probably wouldn't be around today. I definitely wouldn't be. I would have uh, dove off the top of the stadium and <laughs> been a mark on the pavement forever. Uh, we brought up Ray Carruth, uh, yeah. hard topic. I was a fan of his when he got into the NFL until the news hit, and obviously I'm not a fan anymore. Um we talked about Jim Kelly's uh, cancer of the upper jaw. We all wish him the best. Uh, prayers out to Jim Kelly and his family. Uh, and we talked about uh, him playing over his career, the Music City Miracle yeah. we mentioned, uh, the Rob Johnson, Doug Flutie controversy. Marv Levy, uh, Wade Phillips. You know, I just Sam, Sam was a cl very classy guy. You know, bringing up he was a big fan of all all of his uh, old teammates there from Colorado, which was a loaded. Uh, with NFL talent back in the in the early 90s as well. So we want to appreciate, we definitely appreciate Sam for coming on and uh, hope to have him on again. And that's where you're going to find these type of interviews right here on the Outsiders Podcast.